All right, all right, all right, all right. We get it, we get it, we get it. Enough of that. All right, that's a new video from uh, Trump's nephew. Trump's nephew on Twitter. And he's got a new banger track out there about Target targeting your kids. <laughs> is this is this getting amped up really fast now, isn't it? Okay, so this is Jake with Radio Underland on the news. You can find us on Rumble. I believe we're streaming live today uh, at Radio Underland. No spaces, no anything at Radio Underland on Rumble.com. And we are going to jump right into the news, everything that's happening today. And uh, it seems like... It seems like every every major company out there has their LGBTQ AI plus uh, uh, theologies and swag ready to go for this uh, Pride Month that's getting ready to kick off. Everybody is bouncing from Target. All the Karens are saying, we're no longer going to get to do Target. We're going to go to Walmart. Well, you're in trouble because Walmart is getting caught with their pants down too, just like everybody else. And this is according to the Daily Mail, which is a very irreputable uh, media outlet. But Walmart gets the Bud Light treatment over drag queen pride books as outraged consumers vow to take it down next after boycotting Target and North Face and Bud Light and everybody else. Walmart is facing a boycott from angry consumers determined to thwart any brand promoting pride merchandise. The movement began began with a full-force boycott of Bud Light after it partnered with the trans al- activist Dylan Mulvaney. We don't need to rehash that. Everybody knows what's going on. Now Target's facing the backlash. And one thing I want to point out, one thing I want to point out is this is working. This is working. If I jump down to a further news story, it's stating that Target is down $9 billion in their uh, stock prices and you 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 add that to Bud Light being down 15.7 billion dollars and I think that's a total of around 24 billion dollars that these boycotts are doing. Now the problem we have is that Walmart is also doing the same thing. All the other beer manufacturers do the same thing. Miller Lite, Coors Light, all these other, you know, uh, they all do the same thing, just that Bud Light happened to get caught with its pants down, and now Target's getting caught with its pants down, and now Walmart. Uh, what what companies out there are not involved in the whole LGBTQ pride thing? Now, there's a difference between Target and Walmart. Walmart has some books in their children's sections, et cetera, that people are starting to complain about. But I think the thing that really pushed Target over the edge was the tuckable bathing suits in children's sizes. That crosses the line in 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 a in an unbelievable way, but all the countries do this. I mean, we went we went the way of the dodo bird when we got rid of mom and pop stores where you could actually control what was going in. When we opted to have the cheapest Chinese shit coming into our consumer lives from these mega stores like uh, Costco, uh, uh, Target. Walmart, uh, where we demanded the absolute lowest price possible that mom and pop couldn't compete with. So now we deal with these big corporate entities with their corporate equity index, keeping their scores at 100 and 100% going balls to the walls regarding all of the propaganda they're willing to put on their shelves. This is going to be an uphill fight. This is going to be an uphill fight. I think one thing that is happening, though, is that we are being made aware and companies, buyers for these major companies are being made aware that Americans in general will not put up with this nonsense or there could be consequences to face. So that in, in by, 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 by process here is going to make these uh, advertisers, these buyers, these, these people that work for these big mega stores start to, to, to analyze analyze their purchases and what they're going to put on the shelves and they're going to think twice about it they're going to be a little gun shy if we can say that uh gun shy so walmart is in the crosshairs again now rolling stone magazine is coming out 
and they are stating that uh, 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 apparently the infamous libs of TikTok Twitter page is a threat to drag queen story hour. Uh, Rolling Stone is reporting that pedophile child groomers interested in exposing their sexual kinks are uh, actually being concerned of being exposed and having their events protested. Uh, one mayor of a city received 300 phone calls and emails from concerned parents complaining about a drag queen story hour in Mahawa, New Jersey. Um, so Rolling Stones is putting this article out saying that activists gear up for terrifying Pride Month as threats increase and brands drop out. Okay. Uh, Susan Steinberg, the chairman of the Mawa Pride Coalition of Mawa, New Jersey, began organizing a drag queen story hour for Pride Month last year. She anticipated it would be well attended and relatively non-controversial, though Mawa, which has a population of about 26,000, tends to skew conservative. Steinberg says residents have largely been supportive of local pride events. We live in a very nice town, says Steinberg, a realtor. People are friendly most of the time. Then someone asked Steinberg if she had seen the flyer being circulated under doorsteps and among local Facebook groups, accusing the drag queen of hosting it of being a known pornographer and claiming that the event normalized pedophilia and the abuse of children. The backlash went national, and the Mawa Drag Queen Story Hour was publicized on the far-right transphobic Twitter account, Libs of TikTok, and Steinberg says the mayor of Mahawa received more than 300 calls protesting the event. She went to the police to see if she could add extra security in light of all the threats, but she says they told her she would have to pay extra. And then she claims we're a small group, she says. We just don't have the resources. You know what? Screw you. You don't have the resources to do it, then don't do it. Um, I think this is parents taking a stand, making phone calls, emailing mayors, e emailing politicians. Uh, threats? I haven't seen any actual threats. I mean, we see this, this, this propaganda in the media all the time that these transgender people are being attacked. I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? In fact, we read a story uh, about a month ago that being transgender, as far as regarding physical attacks, you're safer being a transgender than you are being a, just a normal citizen of the United States. The, 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 the attacks out there that they claim are just not happening. It's, it's propaganda. But if this is what it takes, if this is what it takes when Drag Queen Story Hour comes up at your local library that you drop an email and drop a line to your local mayor and complain and it threatens these people, I, I mean, we still don't get the whole agenda of why it is so important for somebody to display their sexual kinks, their sexual behavior in front of ch children. Go back to the nightclub. Go back to the gay bar. Go back to wherever you came from and do it there. Nobody complained about that. We only started complaining when you started shoehorning this into our children's education in the schools, etc. Uh, so, you know, that is on you. That's on you. But the pride movement is concerned about protest about violence breaking out at their events. Well, you know what? I don't think it has happened. I think that's just a uh, just a, a talking point that they're using uh, to play the victim in this. But you know what? Keep your dick out of in front of kids, and there will be nothing to worry about. Now, this story here, this story here, it's another story about a trans athlete. Let me bring up the window right here. Uh, uh, again, once again, from the extremely reputable Daily Mail, I'm saying that very sarcastically, but the trans athlete, um, I believe her name is, uh, Asia, Asia. Hold on. I, I don't see her first name here. Yeah. Sian, Sian, trans athlete, Sian Longthrope, uh, apparently took out her long dick and used it to beat the bejesus out of women's record in the race in Wales. Uh, Miss Longthorpe 43 competed last week, uh, in a park run and basically disseminated the record by one minute and 13 seconds ahead of her closest rival, Deb Roberts. Uh, she basically took her dick out and pole vaulted over the finish line. Uh, but transgender athlete who smashed a smithereens women's park run record by a minute and 13 seconds was married man until four years ago. As uh, Roe rages over national events, self-ID gender rules. Uh, once again, this is where males coming out and breaking records in women's sports. They should be ashamed of themselves. But a trans athlete who smashed to smithereens a woman's park run record is today revealed as Sion Longthorpe, who was living as a married man until just over four years ago. Miss Longthorpe, 43, completed last week's fourth crawl, 
Porth Call Park Run in a record of 18 minutes, 53 seconds on Saturday, a full one minute and 13 seconds ahead of her closest rival, Deb Roberts. The outcome of that race in West Wales on Saturday came to national attention today when the result was cited by Mara Yamuchi, a former British Olympian, as an example of what she believes is the exclusion of women athletes and their achievements in the name of being inclusive. She, sh- she stopped short of naming the race or its winner, but Mail Online has learned that she was Miss Longthorpe, a keen amateur runner from Devon. So there is the trans runner. Uh, actually looking decent for a trans athlete. Uh, I don't see any uh, beard or mustache. That's a plus uh, coming, in, uh, coming in clutch there. Uh, there's another picture of the athlete. Oh, here we go up close. Oh, you know what? See, this is scary. This is scary right here because if I was to see this female or this trans female on the right side of my screen, uh, I might actually confuse her for a male. I, I, they're, they're getting better at it. They are getting better at it. Now, if they get better at it and if they just do it and keep their and keep their mouth shut, um, maybe they wouldn't get ridiculed so much. But as far as the competing in, in women's sports, that's still off limits no matter what. Uh, Miss Longthorpe came out publicly as transgender in 2019, is now one of the UK's most high-profile trans runners, having been made a front-runner or brand ambassador by ASICS, the running shoe label. You know, what was I saying earlier about every brand out there is doing the same damn thing? Yeah, ASICS. Is it, are we going to boycott ASICS now? I mean, one thing that's going on right now is this is the day, this is the era, this is the fad of boycott, 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 boycott. Uh, pretty soon you're going to be left without anything to buy because all of these companies do it. See, the problem is, is we let this go too far. We let this go too far. And back, you know, 10 years ago, it was just one or two companies and nobody said anything. And then it goes to where everybody's doing it and nobody said anything that all of a sudden America's are like, damn it, we've had enough. Damn it, we've had enough. Well, guess what? Guess what? Where were you 10 years ago? Where were you in the history of this? Now it's gone to such egregious proportions that there's hardly anything that you can do about it. You know, you're going to have to boycott almost every damn brand out there because they all, they all are, 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 are in on this. They all are in on this. So anyways, let's go here to uh, this next story. And this next story is the Beaver Leavers. And what is going on here is that Oregon... A bunch of counties in Oregon. Basically what it is, it's all the counties that are east of the of the mountains there. They're not on the coast. The inland people in states like Washington and Oregon that are not on the coast, they have a totally different belief system than those that are living in Seattle and Portland and all those kind of things. And so Wallawa County, Oregon, is in the throes of one of the most narrow, nail-biting elections in the region's history. And what is this about? Well, they're trying to get accepted, kicked out of Oregon, and be part of Idaho. Last week during Oregon's special elections, a few thousand Wallawa voters took to the polls to decide on ballot measure 32007, better known as the Greater Idaho Initiative. If the referendum passes, county and commissioners would have to discuss promoting interest of Wallawa County to relocate state borders and prepare a county to become a part of Idaho. Now here's a map down here. You can see this. It's the whole Eastern side of Oregon. These are the counties that have voted. Yes. The ones in red to become part of Idaho and it just, just remove itself from the nonsense that is happening in Oregon. That's being controlled by the population surrounding Portland, et cetera. Um, It's a mass exodus. Is this going to happen? I have no idea. But these counties, all these counties have voted yes, that they do not want to be a part of what the commonly known uh, ideologies of Portland, Oregon, and they want to move over to the more freedom centric, more conservative Idaho. I mean, we see this all the time, man. We see this all the time. California did the same thing. Has it gone anywhere? No. Uh, But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Okay. Another news. 34% of black Americans say Biden's policies have helped them, which is interesting because if you see 34% of black Americans say Biden's policy have helped them, wouldn't that mean that 66% have said that it doesn't? Wouldn't that be the bigger news story? Well, this article from The Hill, I was looking through it, and it said that black Americans continue to be the core support of the Biden administration, according to a new Ipsos Washington Post survey. The survey found that 66% of black American respondents approve of the job 
President Biden has done, while 34 percent believe his policies have helped their demographic. What I found interesting while reading through this article was there was no negative choice. It was 66 percent of black American respondents approve of the job President Biden has done and 34 percent believe his policies have helped their demographic. But there's no negative numbers in here. So I, I question I question the authenticity of this poll and what options were actually given to those being polled. So I'm going to just chalk this up as uh, BS and just burn it in the trash pile because um, I think somebody's pulling a little sleight of hand there. Okay. Los Angeles is back in the news regarding its zero bail policy. It's been reinstated even for repeat offenders. This controversial policy uh, to remove bail requirements for some offenders was put back in place for the city of count for the city and county of Los Angeles, according to ABC Seven News. A judge granted a preliminary injunction in a class action lawsuit that re-implements the policy and prohibits the Los Angeles Police Department and LA County Sheriff's Department from requiring cash bail for some offenders who have been arrested. Uh, Typically, if bail cannot be paid, the accused is forced to wait in jail before arraignment. Reports have indicated that the L.A. County Sheriff's Department has said that the no bail policy only applies to those arrested for misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. Bail policy for sex offenders, domestic violence and offenses involving a weapon still stand as before. However, repeat offenders can still be released without bail but can be made subject to a cash payment. Uh, So an attorney is, uh, what his statement is, what his argument about this is, this attorney is saying that we're supposed to have a presumption of innocence in this country. It's not much of a presumption of innocence when you're in a jail cell. And that was Salil Dadani, Dadani, the lead attorney in the class action lawsuit. And he also says, so for example, vandalism, that's a charge of several of our clients' who were arrested, and that's a $20,000 bail amount. And if the officer claims you committed vandalism, that'll be your bail amount for two to five days without any lawyer or judge looking at the case. Uh, earlier, And this has also been a big push by the uh, reparations task force. Um, they claim that the task force uh, the reparations task force also claimed that there have been disparities between white and black arrestees regarding the chances of being detained before trial and stated that black defendants are 10 to 25 percent more likely to be detained pre-trial or to face financial conditions upon release and median bond amounts are at least 10 percent more and potentially as high as double the amount for black defendants than for white defendants. I don't know. It looks like we're going to have a revolving door at our jails for misdemeanor crimes. And uh, it's just going to just just throw the people back out on the street and let them uh, keep terrorizing other people. No bail because bail, uh, along with other things, is uh, potentially racist. Hmm. Yeah, we hear that all the time. Everything's racist, right? Okay, so we had the story that was going on about the uh, the the Sisters of Indulgence, and you know we went back and forth. The the Dodgers kicked them out, the Dodgers brought them back. Uh, but what nobody is talking about is who were some of the driving forces in the argument to reinstate the Sisters of Indulgence to the LA Dodgers Pride Night. Well, it has come to light that it was a California teachers union, and that California teachers union told the Dodgers that students could die if the Sisters of Indulgence were not reinvited to Pride Night. It's amazing how this, how the California teachers and their union uh, just like to keep, keep putting their fingers in everything in this trans theology that's getting you know blasted everywhere. And these are the fights that they decide to uh, take up arms for and get involved with. And it says here, according to this article, that a powerful California teachers union was part of a successful pressure campaign to get the Los Angeles Dodgers to reinvite a group of drag queen nuns to the team's annual Pride Night. The union suggested that LGBT students' lives were at stake. At a time when LGBTQ plus rights are under attack across the country with more than 400 pieces of legislation filled filed in states at a time when 45% of LGBTQ plus youth report seriously considering or committing suicide each year. 
we should be leading with love and inclusion in California rather than sowing division. That was a quote from the California Teachers Association president. And that was a statement that was released on Monday referring to a uh, re- referring to the wave of red state legislation restricting sex change treatment for minors and a 2022 Trevor Project survey. Uh, our students are watching what happens on and off the field. The union had resolved to speak out after the Dodgers rescinded an offer to honor the drag group known as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence for its advocacy before a June 16th home game against the San Francisco Giants. The resolution, which was obtained by the Washington Free Beacon, went even further than the union's public statements, likening the controversy over the baseball game ceremony to the AIDS epidemic. Okay, we don't need to keep on going on uh, uh, after this. The point of the matter is, is that it was a teacher's union that really stepped up and pressured the Dodgers into reinstating the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence back into the Dodgers' uh, home pride game on June 16th against the San Francisco Giants. But in like news, Bishop Barron, uh, which I don't know much about him, but apparently he's a prominent bishop in the Catholic community. Bishop Barron is calling for a Dodgers boycott, citing the team's support of anti-Catholic drag queen group. Uh, So, I mean, in case you don't know, uh, from its inception in 1979, and in, in, they, they originated in San Francisco's Castro District. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence has been a force that satirizes Catholic beliefs in the name of progressive activism. Uh, when Pope John Paul II visited San Francisco in 1987, the group held an exorcism and a condom savior mass featuring the latex host in Union Square. According to the Catholic League and others, uh, they've, they've had events, all numerous events, including a mock mass with tequila, uh, a Good Friday fetish fashion show, and a midnight confessional contest at a bar with prizes for the hottest confessions. Uh, so, my, I mean, this is not just this is not just your typical uh, trans group of a bunch of buddies going out and having beer at the bar and giving each other lap dances. This is actually a activist group that is targeted, has targeted, has targeted the Catholic community since 1979. That's their end game. That's their goal is they satirically and in whatever sense of humor they think they have are jabbing at the Catholic uh, community. And that's why the Catholics are kind of pissed about this group being included at the Dodgers event. Uh, Bishop Robert Barron, the most famous Catholic bishop in the U.S., has encouraged a boycott of the Los Angeles Dodgers over their relationship with the anti-Catholic drag queen troop. The bishop said Catholics had no other recourse for showing their disapproval since the Dodgers are clearly not responding to a decent appeal to reason. The Los Angeles Dodgers have made it clear to Catholics and all people of good will that they think mockery of the sacred beliefs of the Catholic faith is something that they support and will reward with honors and accommodation. Uh, that was Barron talking to Fox News Digital in an exclusive statement. He also added that it's not enough for the Catholic uh, laity to experience a catharsis is because a bishop has spoken up about this. They need to take action to let the Dodgers organization know that their position is not dis- just disappointing. It is unacceptable. Man, we are in a boycott nation right now. Catholics boycotting the Dodgers, Karen's boycotting Target, beer drinkers uh, boycotting Bud Light, North Face is getting boycotted. Uh, it's just a never ending. I guess that's the way of politics this day. This is this is how your voice gets heard, and it, it's true. This is how your voice gets heard. It gets heard with your wallet. Your wallet. Is this I? Okay, so I obviously screwed up when I uh, mischaracterized the whole Target fiasco, and I didn't think that that boycott would actually take off and gain steam, but it has. $9 billion worth of steam. Is uh, is Is the Dodger situation here, is that going to take off? I don't know. I, I do I do hear a lot of people talking and they are pretty much pissed. Um how this unfolds, I have no idea, but we will sit back and we will see. Now, in uh, other nonsense that school boards across this country are doing to shoehorn uh, uh trans LGBTQ AI plus theology into schools, 
Uh, some parents are standing up and they are actually suing a school district. And this is in uh, Maryland. And the headline here reads that parents take school board to court for assigning LGBTQ books without their consent. And one of the books obviously featured here is Pride Puppy. Uh, So the nuts and bolts of this story is that six Maryland parents are of different religious backgrounds are using the Montgomery County Board of Education. They're suing them for forcing their children to read LGBTQ pride books without parental knowledge or consent. Now, this isn't that these books are just being added to the library. They are actually making this mandatory reading without the parents being involved in these decisions. The federal lawsuit comes after the school board in the affluent Maryland County created a list of 13 newly approved LGBTQ inclusive books and informed parents that they no longer, they're informing the parents that they are would no longer would be allowed to opt their children out of the curriculum. The lawsuit filed by three couples, which names individual school board members as well as Superintendent Superintendent Monifa McKnight, argues that this action violated both a board policy and a state law requiring school boards to inform parents of any material related to sexuality and allow them to withdraw children from the course or lesson. The Maryland law specifically states that parents have the right to object to instructional material and other materials. If the objection is based on beliefs regarding morality, religion, philosophy, any fundamental value system deemed important by a parent, or the belief that the materials are harmful. Beckett, the law firm uh, representing this, these uh, parents, is has been devoted to defending religious freedom for all faiths. It's representing the six Muslim, Catholic, and Protestant parents in the lawsuit filed Tuesday in U.S. District Court for District of Maryland. The Montgomery County Board of Education, which oversees the public school system in a jurisdiction adjacent to the nation's capital, has chosen to ignore the law and force parents' compliance, but these parents won't back down, Beckett said in a press release. I mean, before, parents always had the option, even when it's just basically cisgendered, straight, whatever, sex education, you could opt to take your kids out, but this school board is just saying, no, F that, parents, you don't have a choice, it's mandatory, we're putting your kids in there, and you don't have a voice in this. Uh, That is a broad overstepping of the lines, and it is going way overboard. And I hope that this case gets national attention, and these parents, these six Maryland parents of different religious backgrounds that are suing Montgomery, I hope they win. This is them standing up for parents' rights. And, um, you know, I'm going to skip this story because there's too much hearsay. uh, But the story I was, well, I'll, I'll gloss over it. There's a story that's on TikTok. And it's a teacher who knows if this is real or not. You know, just because you make a TikTok out of something doesn't mean it's real. But a high school teacher is asked to resign after writing students up for cheating, stealing, and sleeping in class. We've seen numerous videos here over the last year of students going absolutely ballistic in classrooms, pepper spraying teachers because they took their phone away, all kinds of obscene, uh, outrageous behaviors from these feral kids that are in classrooms. Um, So does this surprise me that this teacher is asked to resign because he was being too strict with the students after writing up students for cheating, stealing, and sleeping in class? Who knows? Who knows if this is real? But I'll tell you what, the reflection that we've seen in the media and on TikTok, et cetera, about the student behavior in these classrooms is definitely out of control. And we do need teachers to stand up with some stricter classrooms. I believe that all students should have their phones put in a little box by the door before they start class so they can't be on there, you know, listening to whatever the hell they're listening to during class. They need to pay attention. But I cannot give this story much weight because this is one teacher's perspective of him saying that he's being fired be, be, for being strict. But who knows? Who knows? He could be, just be a shit teacher. I don't know. But I can't really report on that. But it is what it is. All right. So this article right here is a is an extreme fluff piece for another uh, trans athlete, and uh, I'm just going to file this in the well duh sports action sequence. And this is regarding a a, a, a comment that was made about the transgender track star by another uh, track athlete, and the other track athlete said, "Well, yeah, she's going to win. She's a man." Well, this man in question is uh, Aaliyah. Aaliyah Hobbs. Now, not only is she, you know, she, she's an Olympian. 
she this transgender athlete has actually in 2021 bumped another female off of our United States Olympic team. And uh, this this kind of behavior I mean, I'm not going to read through this article because this whole article is a, just a big fluff piece about how brave she is, how determined she is, how she goes against the odds, even with all the criticism that comes her way. But how is this possibly fair? You know, like I've said a million times, I do not care what you do, what your sexual kinks are in, in, your, in the privacy of your home or in the privacy of an adult club for that matter. But when you come out and you start competing against women as a former male, and you start taking scholarships and you start crushing dreams as far as knocking other vagina bearing females off of Olympic teams right here, Aliyah Hobbs to replace Shah Kari Richardson in the four by 100 meter relay team for the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. This is an old article, but this trans athlete is bounced off vagina bearing natural born women off of Olympic teams, literally crushing teams, crushing the dreams of women that have dedicated their lives to a sport to be, to compete at, you know, competitive levels on the, on the worldwide scale, something wrong here, something wrong here, but this piece right here, complete fluff piece, honoring this athlete for her, uh, for her braveness to, uh, race against women. And I think it deserves a shout out to this writer, Jency Abrams. Jency Abrams, an accomplished sports news writer at Essentially Sports, is the one that is sucking the dick of this trans athlete and making this fluff piece. And you, madam, should be ashamed of yourself. Uh, Target, we already covered this earlier, but here's the headlines from Hollywood Unlocked reporting the losses of $9 billion in a week following backlash over LGBTQ tuck-friendly pride collection. We already kind of breezed over that. Uh, the wallets are speaking loudly in this boycott. Now, uh, Melissa McCarthy apparently dropped her jelly-filled glazed donut for a second to kind of uh, to, to slam, to speak out against uh, conservatives that are against drag. And she does have one valid point, and let me, let me get to that valid point. What she did is she posted up this post. Let me bring it up here on the screen. Uh, this post, let's see if I can get this bigger. No, nah, I can't really get it bigger. Uh, basically, it's a bunch of different images over the history of uh, television and film. It's got Miss Doubtfire. It's got uh, that movie that where Dustin Hoffman was a female. I forget what it was. Um, but Boozum Buddies or Buddies or whatever. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of them. bunch of just uh, uh, males in drag in media. And uh, Melissa McCarthy, what she said was, I'm trying to get to the quote here. Of all the scary and dangerous things going on in the world, they want to concentrate on this. To anybody who has a real problem with drag, I need to ask, have you been to a drag brunch? It's delightful. So one thing that Melissa McCarthy is pointing out is that in America, we have a, a, a history of trans um, trans performers in or or in drag let's say just say in drag performances in film and movies and i agree we've had a history of this for a long time why everybody is, is deciding to actually stand up against it now um i kind of question we've we talked about disney many times uh, prying in with their gay agenda and cartoons uh, but i was watching aladdin just the other day with my son and i noticed right away that uh that uh that uh, aladdin uh, nobody's talking about the genie being in drag, the big boob genie in drag in the Aladdin cartoons, and that's been going on. So um, Melissa McCarthy has a valid point. Why do you care so much now? Why do you care so much now? And I think we care so much now. Uh, let me answer that. We care so much now because it's not just a ha, 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 look at that, that's funny, a comedic relief in a cartoon, whether it's Bugs Bunny or whatever, in, in a movie. Uh, it's it's gotten to a different level and it all started with these drag story hours in libraries and then it went on to implementing all this indoctrination into books with our children and then as the story that i just read previously where schools are no saying some schools are saying that you don't have the right to not have your children exposed to this material it's when drag drag started going beyond the scope of 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 a drag show in a night sh nightclub or a drag on a TV show, and they when they started pushing it on kids, that's where the when the conservative population came up and started having a really big problem with things, really big problem. Uh, Glenn Beck is out there. Uh, he is stating that the um, basically he's just saying that the boycotts are working. 
I don't need to get into that detail. We all know it is. Uh, the CEO, oh, it, but he is calling out the CEO of Target, and that's Brian Cornell. Because Brian Cornell was asked about the backlash to woke capitalism last week, and his answer does not reflect the moves Target has made this week. He called the woke campaigns, this is the CEO of Target, Brian Cornell, he called the woke campaigns good business decisions and that they are the right thing to do for society and mentioned that it was helping drive sales. Well, how can you say that when later in the week, Target then comes out this Tuesday and said the retail giant will pull some of its LGBTQ-friendly kids' clothing after facing customer backlash, and they have a $9 billion loss. So that is the CEO of Target just talking out of his ass. Rome is burning, and he says it's a good social thing to do, but when the rubber meets the road, conservatives start boycotting, he decides to wake up and uh, change his tune change his tune. Yes. Yes. And good news for those of you that want to be on the cutting edge of technology, me the first to have a Elon Musk brain implant. Well, the FDA has just approved uh, Elon Musk. Uh, what is it? Neuralink? Neuralink? They have approved Neuralink. Uh, the FDA has approved it. Elon Musk company Neuralink announced late today that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration gave it the green light to experiment with implanting brain chips in humans. The company founded in 2016 and primarily funded by billionaire Musk develops electronic implants that decode brain activity and communicate it to computers. While other companies have used brain implants to assist people with de debilitating medical conditions like paralysis and ALS, Neuralink's brain chips have only been used in monkeys, but that will soon change. Uh, Musk said that the future is going to be weird. Musk said he envisions a world where patients can drop by clinics to have a chip surgically implanted into their brains by a robot. And this is a quote from Musk. He says, you'll be able to save and replay memories. He said at a show and tell presentation last year, the future is going to be wild. Uh, man, that is outrageous. Imagine, imagine being able to replay memories in a vivid replay in your brain like you're there. Uh, I can see, I can see that being enticing, going to some of those best moments you've ever had in your life, you know? Yeah, you know, you're finally hooking up with a girl that you've dreamt with all your life. And you're like, hey, hang on, hang on. Let me hit record. I want to be able to play back this later and relive this moment forever and ever. Um, your, your, your kids being born, talking about a photo scrapbook. If it's in your brain and you can relive these moments, relive these memories that are saved to, by Neuralink, I could see how this is going to be exciting for some people. I could uh, imagine people with Alzheimer's, if they had this chip in, implemented, maybe they can relive moments in their life to reintroduce them to who their kids are, etc. It's going to be wild. I agree with the must. That is going to be wild. Okay, here's a story. As I'm getting ready to wrap up this show, uh, here's a story of a parent that was in, uh, it's, it's in Maryland again. And basically what happened is his kid got in a fight earlier in the day. His 14 year old son got in a fight earlier that day in a school. And then after school, uh, the boys that he got in a fight with show up at his house with, along with adults calling him out of his house to fight him. The father comes out and says, no, this isn't going to happen. And these adults and these teenagers that came to continue the fight that happened in the elementary school earlier in the day, they basically took this guy, bashed his head against concrete so many times that they killed him. Uh, well, he was pronounced dead the next day at the hospital, but they destroyed this guy all over an elementary school fight. Now, they don't say anywhere in here what the fight was about, but I mean, just as a, as, as a warning to parents, I mean, come on. These school fights, these kids, these kids, these bullies. I don't know. Maybe it was this guy's son that was bullying the other kids. But come on. Sometimes you got to let stuff go. Uh, here's an interview with, with the wife after it's all said and done. They didn't just ruin our lives. Their lives are going to be changed forever. Their parents' lives are going to be changed forever. And nobody thinks about that just from a fight. 43-year-old Christopher Wright was killed protecting his kids from a fight that started at Brooklyn Park Middle School Friday and was brought to his doorstep in Anne Arundel County. So then Chris came out and to tell them, like, he's not coming out here to fight. And they had threatened at one point to come in and get him. And then they had said that if 
you're not gonna if he's not gonna fight then you're gonna fight us. Tracy Karabchinsky writes fiance says three teens and two adults showed up at her house looking to fight her 14 year old son. But what happened next was criminal. The damage was done before the ambulance ever took him away. He had a seizure. It was done. They there was nothing that the hospital could do. I'll never forget the sounds. I'll never forget the noises my nephews made when we had to tell them he was gone. Wright was taken to shock trauma Friday and pronounced dead Saturday from a traumatic brain injury. The incident was caught on the victim and a neighbor's security camera. I was at shock trauma in the beginning initially and my dad and I tried to go on to the camera to look and the first video that comes up is my 12 year old son screaming daddy, daddy, daddy and running out of the house to go into the street and help his dad. And I couldn't watch anymore after that. I just couldn't. School officials confirmed the fight between the teens and say they worked to address the issue. Now they're working with police on the investigation. Any, anybody who assist or abetted or was an accomplice of, of the, the, the main suspect or the primary suspect in this incident would be culpable. Karabchinsky says Chris was a devoted father who loved the stars and gardening. Her best friend taken over senseless violence. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. And somewhere we as parents are failing these children. 100%. Right? As parents, we're failing. It's not the school's responsibility. It's our responsibility. Anyways, I'm going to wrap this show up. I'm going to wrap this show up. This has been Jake with uh, Radio Underland on the News. I have some more stories to read, but I think I'm going to leave them for the Rumble-only extra stuff on the at Radio Underland channel uh, because it all delves into COVID and the incentivized murder that was happening during the COVID uh, era in hospitals and the facts and and, and direct testimonies from 1,000 people's uh, nurses, nurse practitioners that are coming out to support these financial incentives to let people die of COVID that was going on during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to save that for another uh, video. But this is Jake with Radio Underland on the news. Have a good one. I'll talk to you later. Uh, subscribe to our channel at Radio Underland. Jake on the news. I will talk to you later at Radio Underland. No spaces. Just at Radio Underland.